Good evening, I'm David Nicholas, and next year on CMU Public Television, State Representative Phil Potvin joins me here on Capitol Report. Welcome to Capitol Report, a weekly discussion with your elected officials on the issues and concerns that affect you. Thanks as always for your company as we welcome back to our program uh, State Representative Phil Potvin, Republican from Cadillac. He is currently in his second term for the 102nd District. Representative, uh, good to see you and welcome back to our show. David, thank you very much. A pleasure to be here with you and also our listening and viewing audience. Well, let's begin today with the popular subject of our roads. Uh, you drove in from district and uh, you're home in the Cadillac area. Um, as, as we sit down today, this day after we said hello to the official start of spring. So uh, how was the drive on M115, US 127, and uh, the little roadways in between for you today? Well, they're beginning to patch what they're able to patch, which is wonderful. You know, we, working closely with the Senate, we're able to get $100 million uh, back into uh, all of our county road commissions, as well as our cities and our townships uh, via uh, the one, the Act 51, which uh, really divides that very nicely amongst everyone. So, and we're already seeing that at work, which is very exciting. We we know it's been a tough winter, except for people like myself who like to downhill ski, and then I don't remember a better snow year. <laughs> Well, there were proposals for emergency funding and the compromise was made that produced that mid-year uh, funding bill. Uh, it puts the money, you noted the $100 million figure back in for uh, the locals. It also it deals um, with looking at the, uh, the pothole issue right now. How, how do those numbers, how are they breaking down then? What's going back to the locals? What's dealing with the potholes? What is then being set aside uh, before we get a final road funding bill for projects normal construction projects going into the summer? Well, what we're seeing in the three districts that I'm in, which is uh, Macosta, Osceola, and Wexford counties, they're at least receiving a quarter of a million dollars or more to take care of uh, the deficit that they've already come across because of using all of their salt, using all of their overtime to make sure that our roads are as clean as possible and as safe as possible. You know, safety is the number one issue here, David. And, and that's why we stepped up in the House first uh, uh, and had the Senate follow with it. There is another $115 million that is going to be earmarked also, uh, but starting off with uh, projects that are all ready to go, that are already designed and ready to be bid out. We put out a similar package back in December, and uh, that package in my district uh, came strictly to Wexford County uh, with $2.2 in two of the projects. So we'll see what this next package uh, is, how that is split up, and anything that's left over in that package will again go back to the Act 51 distribution. So either way, everyone is going to be receiving something because we're all in trouble. I mean, even my smaller communities, uh, Morley, Stanwood, uh, all the way over to Remus, uh, they're all gonna be receiving a few dollars just to help out and working closely, again, you've got to work together. You've got to work with your county road commissions because none of those areas have their own road people. If we hit the rewind button, of course, it was last year when the governor called for the $1.2 billion per year over 10 years, and uh, that is a debate that has continued through all of 2013 into this year, uh, though he did not address it as, as specifically in the State of the State address. We heard then at the beginning of the year the $975 million, give or take, surplus, and there was then the, should we spend it on roads? Should we put it into schools? Should we put it into the rainy day fund? The monies you've just talked about, did they come out of that surplus or the general fund, I think there's been some confusion, in fact, even with, with people that have contacted us saying where, we've been hearing these numbers, but what of that surplus is still on the table? Where is the money com coming from that, that went into this kind of emergency mid-year package that you all passed? Well, this emergency mid-year package came out of the general fund. As far as having an, any extra dollars go, we really don't. Uh, sitting in on the revenue uh, conference that we had in January, we basically were told that you know, based on what would happen with previous administrations, their commitments, especially to our larger industries, 
uh, we're anywhere between 600 and 850 million dollars of that surplus that is already pre-committed depending on how these people are with keeping their employees, keeping their commitment to the state of Michigan, investing in Michigan for more jobs, because we're all about jobs. And we really, I think, have been fairly successful with that. But we need to keep that commitment. And that also then goes with the tax reform, removing the Michigan business tax. Because when that happened, we did give all of our industries, especially the manufacturers, an opportunity to say, do you want to come on the new tax roll and pay only 6% straight? or do you want to stick with your Michigan business tax? Most corporations stuck with that Michigan business tax, in particular if they had some benefits that they were already receiving uh, because they would have given that up if they'd just gone to the 6%. So the other piece is that the governor then asked us for $65 million for our Great Start program to match up. We've committed with that, and by the time you uh, add those two pieces together, uh, we're pretty well out of money. So what then happened to the, because there was also the call, a call for potentially uh, some personal tax relief and there were even some proposals out. Uh, State Representative uh, Tim Kelly saying let's uh, take it from, I believe it was a figure of uh, 4.25 down just under 4 over a span of time and then eventually there was a call even within one of his bills to take it down to 0.1% by 2017 if we saw revenue generated of 300, there was a, a formula mixed in there, but it was, it was going to be taking that income tax rate down. Is that something that we would not be under this scenario addressing at this time? I don't really see that happening only because most of my constituents are saying, hey, with the way the roads are, don't give me back 25 or $30 in a tax rebate. I'm happy to put that part going forward. However, don't uh, you know, raise my uh, fee for registration. Don't raise my license fees on me. You know, but for the most part, people are willing to, and we are paying tax. And you're watching our gas prices move all over. We're being blamed for a lot of that. In the truth, all of those numbers from the state, from the federal government are fixed. So they're not the ones moving at all. It's your local distributors that are moving those dollars around. And people say, well, let's get in and, and do that. Well, we don't want to create a monopoly for sure because then we are in trouble. We'd rather have that free enterprise here. Another way to look at it is exactly what we did earlier this year with our wholesale tax as far as aviation fuels go and I did have a piece of that bill and what my bill proposed is that we keep the very same people that those dollars had been going to namely our schools also our local airports and make sure that uh, our roads too, transportation got the pieces that they were used to getting and then anything above and beyond that would be going specifically to transportation. And so that's what we've been talking even more about, David, this time is, you know, let's look at a wholesale tax instead of a retail tax. Because there is that 6% Michigan retail tax that is on the gasoline now. So as it moves up, yeah, some more does come into our state coffers. But most of that has already been pre-earmarked for our schools. And the last thing we want to do at this point is take dollars away from our schools. We're constantly, ever since I have been there the last three plus years, we've tried to put more dollars in after the first year where we had to fill in that big hole that we got. You know, we run a balanced budget here in Michigan and are very proud of it, but also proud that we've been responsible in getting our budget done in a timely manner by the end of May, first part of June, so that all of our schools, all of our local governments know what money they're going to be receiving from us and can make their plans. Well, let's enter into that then. Uh, Senator Howard Walker, he's calling for an elimination of all taxes on gas and applying then an increase of 1% on the sales tax to everything. Now, as you then were explaining, 2% of the sales tax on gas is by the Constitution already being set aside for uh, the schools. That was something that I don't think a lot of people, until we got into this road debate within the last a uh, couple of years, I don't know that that was common knowledge that that was uh, a part of the funding equation. So given the fact that by the Constitution that's called for, um, help me help us run some of the numbers. Would it allocate an increased, if not full amount, of what the governor is calling for annually on the roads? If we take all those taxes off but put 1% across the board on everything, 
then how much do we end up potentially for roads and potentially for schools? Well, and that becomes a guess. It really does. And I'm not very good at guessing. I, I'm a concrete man, and so I'm a solid numbers guy. And that, that, again, becomes a guess. The other thing that has been coming up is the fact that maybe we do the same thing uh, with our gasoline as we did with the aviation fuel, and that is go to a wholesale tax so that we're sure where we are and uh, set this up at the distribution level. And uh, that way it doesn't fluctuate, but it would be a fixed number. What that number is, I am not sure at this time. We're still looking at that as an opportunity. However, saying that, I don't anticipate that happening uh, before uh, we come back in November. What then could be a shorter long-term solution, do you think? What, what, because people did not, as you said, uh, when the governor said, well, we could raise the vehicle registration fee, we could uh, you know, make the other increases in, in that scenario that he proposed, mm -hmm. and the resounding reaction was not very positive. Right. What then do you think could be? the answer that might, might well, solve this. Well, that's why we'll see that uh, coming more to us, I think, after the election in November. And that being with the wholesale gas as a possibility, also looking at Senator Walker's proposal. And uh, that's where the debate will really take place. I'm just anticipating that one of those will come out of the House, Senator Walker's will come out of the Senate. And we'll be talking about both of those avenues on how to take care of this. We realize it's a long-term situation, no question about it, and we are going to be responsible. Uh, that's why we don't want to rush into this. We've, we've rushed in right now, taking care of the first challenge, which is let's fix things from this winter, and that really carries everybody well into the summer months. And we've also got road construction plans that are out that we you know, handed out the uh, one point one five million uh, back in December. And then they'll be recalculating, I guess, that long term, and that was another one right. of uh, the things that the governor pointed out. If we don't do it now, then we're adding only so much to the problem down the road. But exactly. eventually all those numbers will get on the table. Um, you were on the education and school aid uh, committees in the House. Another note from uh, the Senate side and, and uh, Traverse City uh, Senator Howard Walker. He's called for an increase to the per pupil school aid allocation that he says would do away with grants and put the money back into what uh, he says would be more access to the per pupil fund. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone understands how some of that funding um, mechanism had been shifted towards um, grants versus the, the per pupil funding. If you can help us understand that, because he says it would now generate $150 to $300 more potentially for students. So did we have an adjustment towards grants and incentives versus across the board per pupil? And, and how do this, does this proposal uh, look going forward? Well, we have. And, and again, just trying to get more dollars into schools, but specifically into schools that are performing well, where we have positives. You know, we have quite a few schools that are in deficit situations. Buena Vista over in the Saigon area, a great example of that. And they knew they were in trouble uh, the last three, four years, but yet did nothing about it except go deeper in the hole. And that's why the state superintendent finally stood up and said, I've got to close this down. He didn't want to, but there wasn't a choice. And we have some other school districts doing that very same thing and expecting, again, the state to bail them out for poor choices or no choices. And we refused to do this at this particular point. You know, so our governor, I think, has done a great job of looking ahead and trying to get people moving in a positive way, not a negative way. He's not a negative person, nor am I. And in doing that, uh, he's tried to say, hey, come on, step up, try some of these different incentives if this is where we want to go. And, and so that's where those dollars have come from, where if we go in and just give a straight carte blanche per pupil, um, these incentives are gone. And, and how will that take us forward? Uh, it becomes the question. And so that will be debated, no, no question about it. The thing I've been so proud about sitting, and this is the appropriation side, not the policy side, we're the dollar side. Sitting on that is to be able for our rural and our northern Michigan schools especially, getting that 2X formula back this year 
and we're also looking at keeping it in for next year with some added dollars again for our rural districts. You know, the one thing I constantly am reminding our governor of is one size does not fit all. Please, you know, we are not the urbanites here. Our hand is not out all the time. We're taking care of our people to the best of our ability. And, you know, don't put us in the same place. You know, the vote that we took uh, just yesterday, the EAA vote, specifically for underwater Detroit schools, I voted no on. And I also, they said, well, what will it take to get your vote, Representative? And I said, what it will take is my snow day bill, similar to what we did last year, going through this year. And last year, we didn't have a, a time limit on that. This year, my proposal would be to put a 60-minute minimum time on it. And as you break that out to classes, it becomes 10 minutes a class. But if extending it that way versus <clears throat> a minute or two here or there, that doesn't make any difference. Uh, my challenge was that both our state superintendent, uh, Mr. Flanagan, as well as the governor stepped up and said, you know what, if you've got a snow day, you've got to make up a full day, period. But they're not considering a couple of things. And my comment back to both of them was, you know, when was the last transportation check that you wrote? Because in our Cadillac community, $6,700 a day to run our buses. And we're one of the medium-sized transportation groups. So. You put that out, if we could extend some school days here, what makes sense? Let's use some common sense. And I haven't been able to get that out of the committee. And at this point, because we're almost up to spring break again, uh, it really won't give those schools much of an opportunity at all. It gets into then some of the debate over how much money is being spent and, and how uh, that money is being spent, I think. And, uh, a recent Inside Michigan Politics poll said that the governor, this is uh, basically quoting from uh, their release, uh, that's, that the governor has cut K-12 education funding. That was what the poll said the majority of those polled had uh, expressed. It gave two options, whether funding had been increased or decreased since the governor took office. So a chance then for you to, to weigh in on this one way or the other, um, because there has been a move we, from what the governor said in terms of how some of the added money was being allocated specifically to the pension funds, not to the per pupil funding. And, and therein lies that perception of how, and, and, and then when we look at things like what has to be taken for running transportation as opposed to in the classroom instruction. Right. So well, let's in the break classroom. it down a little bit then. Okay. Where, where is the money going and how is it being spent? Uh, well, it really has been going in, in both places, no question about it. Uh, again, going back to you know, the governor's challenge to our school districts to come up uh, on his dashboard and, and do the different dashboard items in order to get extra dollars. And so we have continued that way to put dollars in. We've also continued, though, to increase the dollars per pupil. Uh, it's been small, no question about it, but it has been an increase every year but that first year. In that first year, we did not because we didn't have the dollars to increase it. But the schools had just the year before taken all the Obama money uh, at one time when they were asked, do you want it at one time or do you want it piecemeal? And they said, oh, give it all to us now. And they spent it all immediately. So uh, it comes back to some practical management uh, tough choices, no question about it. I was just reading today over in the Barrington School District, 31 kids in the first grade class. Very difficult, very difficult. Fortunately, they do allow volunteers to come in. And that helps with grandparents and parents who are willing to give of their time and their talents and, and come on in and, and help out. Uh, because if you put then a challenged child in that classroom, that really makes it difficult. Having two autistic granddaughters as I do, I know how challenging that can be. And again, coming out of the classroom as a former teacher, I understand this. And, and these are challenges that are ongoing for sure. When then is a cut a cut, or when is it a reduction in uh, a partial restoration in funding, and when is it tied to a 
quote unquote cut because it is not at the rate of the prior year increase. And th this is probably way more complicated than we would have time for, but I think it gets down to then the politics and how these numbers maybe are being perceived and used, especially as we'll probably see in the debate during an election year. Well, they potentially will be for sure, and I don't see it coming back so much to us as representatives or even as senators, but that debate will be uh, firsthand with the governor and the candidate uh, that the governor is running against. Uh, from our end, uh, pretty much working closely as I do with all of our superintendents, I meet with our superintendents in the 102nd District quarterly just to make sure that we are on the very same page. The, vote that I took yesterday on this EAA. I'd already contacted these superintendents to say, you know, where are you comfortable? And if, Phil, we get absolutely nothing out of that EAA. We're looking for something. If you can get us something, vote for it. If you can't, stay tight on your no. And I said, thank you very much. And my question to my leadership was, what about my snow day, Bill? Will you help us out here? And the answer was no. I said, well, then you know what my answer is on my vote. And I was one of those 54 that said, no, thank you. So to that and, and that proposal that, that would deal with uh, the snow days allowing that flexibility, we won't always see winters to the extreme that we have seen this year, we, we hope, but, but certainly it, it comes into play when we have had the type of winter that we have had and the number of days that have been canceled. At the same time, there is the proposal for the pilot program to look at year-round schooling. Is there any way where uh, some of that flexibility in the calendar or a move to a year-round school um, scenario where, where some of those things might end up getting blended, do you think? Well, quite a few of our school districts are already doing year-round school, and really what the governor's proposal is, only $2 million, and it would be to pilot schools that are hand-picked uh, and only to help them with their physical plants. In other words, put air conditioners in so that these kids aren't sitting there, you know, during the 80 and 90 degree temperatures that occasionally we get, and that's only occasionally. Uh, the schools that are doing that are really finding that their students are doing better. I mean, Lincoln Elementary School in the Cadillac area for quite a few years did a year-round school. Fortunate thing for them was most of the children lived in the neighborhood and walked to school, so we didn't have a transportation issue. It uh, works, I think, much better with elementary than with the high schools uh, because by the high school age, you've got a lot of young people having summer jobs, uh, doing other things, uh, actively traveling, uh, and that would uh, cut down on some of that. But really what you're looking at is a nine-week period in the classroom, a uh, two-week period basically or to three weeks depending on the time of year and around a holiday or not. Uh, How common is it then? I, th I think it would be a surprise um, as we begin to, to kind of wind down our conversation here, but, but for people that are so used to the calendar being set up the way it was, capitalizing on summer tourism, and what we were always told for years was, especially through so much of Michigan being tied to agriculture and getting uh, young people back to help out on the family farm and in those, those types of industries, I don't have figures in front of me. Maybe you have better access to those numbers. How many schools really are already operating more of a, a year-round calendar percentage-wise? Do we have a figure on that? I, I do not, no. Uh, a guesstimate would be less than 10%. And then do you see the potential then with, I mean, this pilot program, again, calls for some increase. Uh, how long do you think it will take in the evaluation process to, to see if this is a more feasible uh, situation they, they were like, expanding they, they, statewide? Yeah, they, they were looking at a two-year pilot program. The one school in northern Michigan that has been very active and very vocal about it is the Baldwin School District. And uh, their superintendent, ready to go. Uh, but he only has two buildings. So an easy thing for them to do. As opposed to, As opposed to a, a multiple situation, right. Right, where you look at the, the widespread and then you get into all those transportation hey, And the other real challenge for us, David, now is that a lot of our young people don't take those summer jobs. You know, they're taken by seniors who have found that their money has run out or because uh, things that cost more today, they need some more dollars to survive. I mean, when was the last time you walked into McDonald's and saw somebody who's in their 70s 
helping at the counter, helping to clean up. Um, you know, that didn't used to happen. It's happening today. The other real challenges for our agricultural end, a lot of the young people uh, don't want to work physically. They Mentally, absolutely, but not physically. I mean, when I was a young man going through high school, our summer jobs were pruning Christmas trees. Talking to the pruners today, they can't get people. They have to import people. And this is where the governor then has talked about you know, helping to import some more labor specifically for this type of job with some talent, trying to keep them here, encourage them to stay here so that we can get these jobs done. Last year we had quite a few apples that just didn't get picked because we didn't have the workforce over on the west side of the state to pick those apples. And that, that's really sad when you have such a wonderful crop as we did last year. You know, with Michigan, we're in the top 10 in everything that we produce. And now with California being challenged with the drought that they have, uh, Michigan, if we get a nice easy thaw this spring and farmers can get out and get in their fields, get things planted, we're going to have another wonderful productive year. And uh, that's good news for Michigan. Many things in play here that, that are likely to have an impact beyond what we have seen in, in the past that have been so dominated simply uh, by the budget. We're going to have to see where a lot of these things that we talked about today uh, play out in the weeks on down the road, but we appreciate your time in addressing all of these, and uh, thanks very much for taking the time to join us. Well, you're very welcome, David. My pleasure, and from an agriculture standpoint, hey, things are still growing. You know, we're looking to expand our local markets again, our local food hubs, and uh, continue to reach out in a very positive way, working with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation and that rural uh, development that is part of the Ag Department. So I've been very proud to work with Jamie Clover Adams and, and her staff uh, on, in the Ag Department and uh, you know, also looking forward to working with uh, Director Kinney as we continue to grow that together and grow our exports in particular. We, we've already done a nice job of hitting the targets the governor has set up for us in all areas and we have been one of those successes as a department. Good news heading into the, uh, the, the growing season actively then. Thanks so much for taking uh, the time that you have done to uh, join us here. We've been speaking with uh, Representative Phil Potvin from uh, Cadillac, the Republican representative of the 102nd District. Our program uh, tonight will air again in our overnight time slot here on CMU Public TV and soon posted to our website. Go to WCMU.org, click on TV and to WCMU Productions for the link to the Capitol Report page. For Chris Ogazali and all of our crew, I'm David Nicholas. Thanks for being here, and have a good week. You've been watching Capitol Report. Join us again as your elected officials speak to your concerns on current issues.